Hi. Hi. How are you? You're right up front. Are you ready today? Yeah? Okay. All right. Good morning. It's good to see you all. We're happy to be here with you. And uh, it's a good day to gather together in worship. We're going to begin our worship by ringing our church bell. Morning, y'all. All y'all who brave this lovely weather. It's gorgeous outside. Till you go out there. Welcome. This is the day the Lord has made. Y'all are good. All right. Uh, after worship today, there's a diaconate board meeting. Tomorrow night, there's a board of trustees meeting. And there's choir on Thursday. Feel free to drop in. And next Sunday, very important annual meeting. We need to have a quorum or we get to schedule it later. And we don't want to do that. So please try to be here. Round up anybody that you don't see here and bring them with you. Uh, the rest of the announcements, you're really good at reading on your own. Is there anyone who has an announcement they would like to share? Well, today is kind of a sad day for our congregation. Doreen is going to be going south. So it's a happy time for her, but not for us. <laughs> but we want to thank her so much for every time that she comes and plays for us. She's so talented and does such a beautiful job. So, Doreen. Doreen, <laughs> come on up here. Is she ignoring me? Doreen. <laughs> come on up here, lady. <laughs> She'll be back in the spring. But, <laughs> but we just wanted to show her our appreciation. Come here, you. Oh, flowers are for you. Yeah. Oh, they're gorgeous. This is for you. Thank you. And our thanks for the whole winter. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I would like to invite all women of the church, bring your neighbors, bring your friends, bring your relatives, um, to Women's Fellowship begins their 2024 year with a potluck luncheon this Friday at noon back in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we'll have some fun and some laughs and some lots of chatter, and uh, we'll be out of here by two. Thank you. Somebody want to take a mic to Mildred, please? Good morning. The Martin Luther King Breakfast will be held this Saturday, January the 13th, at the Elf Lodge, beginning at 9 o'clock. And we are really honored to have Pastor Darrell as our speaker, and we are anxiously waiting to see what joke he's going to tell. <laughs> Is that it for announcements? All right. Please join me in the call to worship. It's over now. The shopping, the wrapping, the baking, the gathering, and the travel. This rush is behind us, but the meaning of Christmas lives on within us. The season of Epiphany reminds us of the appearing of our Lord. And we declare with the prophet, the Lord God is in your midst. A mighty one who will say, He will rejoice over you with gladness. 
he will quiet you by his love. We will rejoice and exult with all our hearts. The King, the Lord, is in our midst, and we gather in praise and worship. Please join me in the invocation. Our loving God, the dawn of a new year calls us to reflect on our past and your shepherding care. And we also rely on your continuing guidance as we move into the future. Help us to live every day seeking your way and moving on your path where you lead. This day, receive our praise, dwell in our midst, and create in our hearts a deep yearning for your presence and your kingdom. In your name and by your goodness and mercy, we pray. Amen. And please rise as you are able, and we will sing 522, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us, verses 1, 2, and 3. to each other and share the sign of peace.
Children's time, you want to come up? Okay, all right. You want to sit down? So, this is a new year, 2024, and 2023 is over. And um, I want you to think about 2023. What happened in 2023 that was a blessing or that you're grateful for? Or maybe you're grateful for your family, your pets. Maybe something happened, right? Can you think of anything? About you, Luna? What happened in 2023 that you're really grateful for? I was moved up to varsity. <laughs> wow! Good for you! Is that uh, soccer or basketball? Basketball. Basketball. Oh, good. Yeah. I remember I saw that game you were in, man. And uh, how about you, Leela? I learned new instruments. So what, what instruments do you know now? Um, I know cello, quads, electric bass guitar, and upright bass. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. How about Lola? Um, I uh, learned new stuff in school. Okay. Why don't you tell them about your award? Was that last year or this year? Your, for, for the art, the art award. Oh, um, I got an award for uh, the coloring competition in the newspaper. Yeah, she was in the newspaper last week. Yeah, yeah. How about you? What are you grateful for for last year? I forgot. She forgot. Okay, well, you know, probably grateful for your pets, right? What kind of pets do you have? Um, fish, but one fish that is a baby still alive, but two of the grown-ups died from the red fish. Oh, oh, so so a couple of fish died, but you like your fish, huh? And I have seven chickens and one dog. Seven chickens. I know where we can go for eggs, right? <laughs> to your house? <laughs> okay. All right. You guys know this song? It says, can you count your blessings? Name them one by one. Can you count your blessings? See what God has done. So what is God's? Um, most important blessing to all of us. Anybody? Our, our, our life. Gave us our life? Who did he give us? Me. Jesus. <laughs> okay. So in 2024, and in Sunday school, we talked about what you guys want to achieve or what you want to do. So let's share that. Uh, Jocelyn, what do you want to do this coming year? You want to learn something, don't you? Yeah. What? What is it? Math. Math? That's not what you said in Sunday school. What did you say in Sunday school? I want to learn to read. Yeah, she wants to learn to read really good. Yeah, she's already got a good start on it. How about you, Lola? Um, learn to, uh, well, not learn, but um, clean my room without someone telling me to. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Can I take you home? <laughs> she wants to learn to clean her room without somebody telling her. I mean, what kind of kid is that? Everybody wants that kind of kid. How about you? Um, I need to stop, like, in basketball games, I need to stop fouling so much because my teammates need me. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? Make it to state. Make it to state in band? Yes, yes, okay. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for our many blessings. Help us to remember those blessings on a daily basis, but especially the greatest blessing of all, the gift of Jesus Christ, your Son. Help us to be faithful, to follow his teachings, to love our neighbors as ourselves, and especially those pesky brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, Pastor. I think, Luna, I think all of us, it would be good for us to learn not to foul so much. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah. Hmm? 
What? Hi. Sorry. I just fouled up, so that's all. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a visual aid. Good message for the first Sunday of Epiphany. Good message. We want to share joys and concerns now. There are joys and our concerns. Lord, there are, are a lot of a lot of worries represented here this morning. I have no idea what all of them are. But God, you know every one of them. And we thank you that we don't have to be stuck in worry or burdened or overwhelmed. We thank you that you've promised to care for our needs. 23rd Psalm that we're going to spend some time studying doesn't say we'll receive everything we desire, but that we'll never lack for what we need when we place our lives, Lord, in your keeping. And so help each of us here this morning to declare you as our Lord, our good and loving and saving shepherd. Now, every one of us could make this very, very personal by saying, Lord, you, you know what I'm worried about or what I'm trying to deal with just on my own. 
Part of my worry is that I don't know how to handle it. The fact is, I know I can't, but I trust that you can. You're my shepherd. Give me the strength to deal with what you and I can together at the time that I need to. And so give your discernment, your wisdom, the insight to choose and act wisely as one, of, as one who follows your leading. And use the worry to draw me closer to you. Each one of us could pray this, Lord. I give my life to you because I know you care. And you're the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7, says this, Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. God's presence is our assurance. We're blessed under God's care, and in that realization, we give our tithes, our offerings, with thanks this morning. We now receive our morning offering. Loving Lord, like a constant shepherd, you provide us with all that we need. And so it's a privilege to give back to you these tithes, these offerings, thanking you for your watchful and your loving care over us. We pray it in your name. Amen.
Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalms 23. And if you look at the screen, we have this lovely picture, thank you, Bromlings, of a shepherd. And that is what Jesus is for us as a shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. The word of God for the people of God. Over the next few weeks, we're going to spend some time with the 23rd Psalm, one of the most beloved and most quoted portions of Scripture in all the Bible. It's the Psalm of David. Great preacher Charles Spurgeon called it the Pearl of the Psalms. The Pearl of the Psalms. Alexander McLaren wrote that it has dried many tears, supplied the mold in which many hearts have been poured into trusting faith. I remember memorizing it in vacation Bible school when I was uh, probably first grade at the Gospel Tabernacle up in Grangeville with Mrs. Wyckoff. That's before my mom and dad were Christians. As a pastor, I've read it at funerals and shared it as comfort in probably hundreds, hundreds of hospital rooms. And I think as we move into a new year and then approach the season of Lent, remembering the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus, it just seems appropriate to focus on this psalm that expresses the confidence that we can have as we move through our days and into this new year, the saving and protective care that we have through our shepherd, and the fact that as his flock, we're all cared for, and we're cared for together. There was a little fourth grade Sunday school teacher teacher of fourth grade class was beginning to teach this 23rd Psalm. And she asked if one of them could remember how it started. How does the 23rd Psalm start? And a little boy in the fourth grade class said, the Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need. Is that a pretty good way to do it? Yeah. Can you say that with me? The Lord is my shepherd and that's all I need. Okay, that's all I need. And it's really true, isn't it? Opening verses establish the primary theme of, of the first four verses, actually. Here's three versions from the first verse. New International. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Living Bible says, because the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And then the King James that we're really familiar with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word that gets translated Lord is actually a substitute for the Hebrew word Yahweh. Actually, there were no vowels to that Hebrew word. It was all just consonants. It's Y-H-W-H. The vowels got added later. You might remember that that's the name that God gave to himself when he first disclosed it to Moses, the burning bush, around 700 years before David. Moses was being sent into Egypt to bring the people out of bondage, the bondage of slavery. He was uh, very hesitant to do that. In fact, he stuttered. I don't know if you realize that Moses did stutter, uh, and this is not a joke. <laughs> uh, he stuttered, and it's actually uh, within the Hebrew of, of Exodus that it shows a stuttering pattern when Moses is speaking to God. And uh, he said, I, who am I to be able to go into Pharaoh's presence 
just on my own. So who shall I say sent me? And God's response was, God's reply was, I am. Tell them I am has sent you. Well, that's I am and always will be. It's a present tense, always present tense God. And there in Exodus 3, it's a personal name, actually, that God gives to himself. And the Hebrews considered that name so holy that they wouldn't actually say it out loud. Instead, they would substitute the word Adonai, which means Lord. A lot of times in your Bibles, if you look at through the Old Testament, you'll see the word Lord and every letter is capitalized. And when you see it written that way, every letter of the word Lord capitalized, you realize that that is substituted Adonai, Lord Adonai for Y-H-W-H, the name of God. Well, this great God, timeless and self-sufficient, this all-powerful God, creator and master of the universe, the psalm says, is, is my shepherd. The present tense God is a present tense shepherd. David doesn't write, O Lord, be my shepherd. It's simply an affirmation of trust. And the verb is actually a, a participle that means is shepherding me is shepherding me. So through this 23rd Psalm, we'll see and learn more about our shepherd, who is, who he is, and how he tenderly and continually cares for us. How does he care? And what does he do? Well, one day as David was watching his sheep, you can almost see it happening. He's watching the flock, watching his sheep. The idea came to him that God is like that. He thought of the incessant care that sheep require, their helplessness, their defenselessness. He recalled their foolish straying from safe paths, their constant need for guidance. He thought of the, the time and the patience that it took for them to trust him before they would follow him. He remembered the times when he led them through danger, how they huddled close on his heels. He pondered the fact that he must think for his sheep. He must fight for them and guard them and find them pasture and quiet pools. He remembered their bruises and their scratches that he bound up, and he marveled at how frequently he had to rescue them from harm. Yet not one of his sheep was aware of how well it was being protected and watched. And so to summarize... Just ask a question, what does a shepherd do? Well, a shepherd, a shepherd basically provides, provides. He provides food, shelter, basic necessities for the sheep. A shepherd protects. He guards against enemies and harm and, does, and danger. And he guides. He leads his sheep when they're confused and when the sheep don't know which way to go. And he corrects. He corrects the problems. And he corrects the sheep. So these are the things the Lord promises to do in our lives provide or provide protect guide and correct provide protect guide and correct and the lord is like a shepherd in fact the prophet isaiah says it in isaiah chapter 40 verse 11 god tends his flock like a shepherd now if the lord is like a shepherd whether we want to admit it or not that makes us what? Makes us like sheep. Over the years, over the years, I've taken a lot of kidding about my descriptions of sheep. Now, we've been here with you a while, and you know that I grew up in Grangeville. And you may have heard me say at some point that my uncle raised sheep. So I have fed lambs from a bottle. I've cleaned out sheep barns. I've made some attempts at herding. And I have to tell you, sheep are without question the most stupid animals on the face of the earth. <laughs> they, are, they are dumb, dirty, timid, and defenseless. They have a propensity for getting lost. They don't go looking for trouble, but they have a predisp predisposition to find it somehow. They know the voice of their shepherd, 
And that's about it. They do no tricks. They cannot shake. They cannot shake. They do not sit. They do not beg. They literally don't have enough sense to get in out of the rain. Now, I have checked this with Lee. <laughs> it's not just my assessment. Chuck Swindoll writes this, Sheep lack a sense of direction. They're virtually defenseless. They're awkward, weak, and ignorant. Pitifully slow, devoid of an angry growl. They're easily frightened. By nature, unclean. They will remain filthy indefinitely in, unless the shepherd cleanses them. And then Max Lucado, always witty, says this. <laughs> he just says, sheep are dumb. <laughs> Have you ever met a sheep trainer? Ever seen sheep tricks? Anybody ever met somebody who taught his sheep to roll over on command? Ever witnessed a, a circus sideshow featuring Mazadon and his jumping sheep? No. Why? What does Lucado say? <laughs> sheep are just too dumb. Now, when I told all that to Lee, I checked this out because I said, Lee, I don't want to offend you. Okay. I checked this out with Lee. He agreed. And then, bless his heart, this is what he said. But sheep have feelings. And it's true. They have feelings. And so do we. Now, all we like sheep, Isaiah says in chapter 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. To be compared to a sheep, sheep have feelings. We have feelings. But to be compared to a sheep kind of hurts my pride. And that too is part of the problem. It's simply true. You and I are like sheep. There are little ones that have to be carried some that can barely get along, others that always want to be out front, all that need to be cared for and protected, some that bully and butt and push, and Lee was just butted by a ram of his flock, what was it, just a couple weeks ago? Hit him from behind and knocked him down. There are sheep that just bully and butt and push. Sheepish, timid. Those that graze their way to lostness. And others that are deliberately on the lamb. <laughs> Joe shakes his head. <laughs> Joe, 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 look at me. Look at me. It's all of us. You, you, and you, and me. Okay, all right. E W E. You, and okay, he got it. Okay, all right. <laughs> we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd, a present tense shepherd for a world that can be all too tense and worrisome and frightening. And we're told that the great God of the universe has stooped to take such care of us like sheep, like sheep. We want to yield to the shepherd's care and to his will. So how do I let the Lord be my shepherd? How do I do that? Well, first, I've got to acknowledge God, acknowledge the Lord, first of all, for my life. Acknowledge Jesus as my Lord. Listen again to how that first verse reads. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord cannot be my shepherd until the shepherd is my Lord. The two go together. Either we belong or we don't. So what does it mean to be Lord? Well, it means to be in control. Lord simply means whoever's in charge. Today, we might put it in terms like boss or manager or CEO or chairperson of the board. Jesus Christ is Lord of our life. If he is the one calling the shots. If he's not in charge, 
he's not Lord. If he's not Lord, he's not my shepherd. Listen to how Jesus himself put it. It's in John chapter 10, verses 14 and 27. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Now that's in John chapter 10. Now, did you hear the three words that show us what it means to have Jesus as Lord? Jesus says it. Know, listen, and follow. You know Jesus, you listen to Jesus, you follow Jesus. He's in charge. What it means is that I've yielded, yielded my life, I've yielded to my control, the control of my life, over to him, his guidance. So if anyone or anything else is shepherding us, we'll never be satisfied, is what the Lord is saying there. If our job is the thing in charge, then there's going to be restlessness and all kind of feverish activity, frustration and worry. Or if another person is our chief shepherd, we're always going to be disappointed and ultimately left empty because no one else can fill the space inside us that only the Lord is meant to fill. Any area where the Lord is not first is going to become a source of worry or upset for us. It can be marriage or singleness, dating relationship. It could be some problem, some hurt, health or lack of it. It can be a death or some possession. It can be sports or recreation, the way we make or spend our money, selfishness, lack of caring, the way we spend our time, any area any area where God is not first, any area where God is not Lord, is going to become worrisome for me because nothing else was ever meant to take the place of God. Now notice too, notice too the word my, my shepherd. It's such a difference that little, that little two-letter word makes. It's an affirmation of relationship makes all the difference, all the difference, whether you can say Jesus is a shepherd or Jesus is my shepherd. Jesus is a savior. Jesus is my savior. As a shepherd, the Lord gives you all, his, all of his attention, all of his caring, all of his love, as though you're the only sheep, as though you're the only one. But as a sheep before the shepherd, we have to yield to him, receive him, receive him as Lord, say yes to that relationship. What does it mean that Jesus is my shepherd? Well, it means that I begin talking with him about everything. Pray about all the stuff that we usually worry about. You don't have, if I don't have time to pray, but I still have time to worry, what kind of sense does that make? So this year, why not praying about all the things you've just been worrying about? Because worry doesn't change a thing, but prayer does. Worry, someone has said, worry is stewing without doing. <laughs> okay? Stewing without doing. Worry doesn't accomplish anything. Do you know they actually did an experiment? It was back east. They took, they got... Through a survey, they got 100 of the world's best worriers together. 100 of the world's best worriers together. They put them all into a room for 24 hours. They all did their best worrying all together for 24 hours straight. And you know what happened? Not a thing. Okay. <laughs> That's not true. That's, they didn't really get all those people together. Okay. So... Joe, you didn't know that. <laughs> He's over there gagging. Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. Worry. Worry, worry is, un don't worry about me, Joe. Okay. Worry is unhelpful. It's unreasonable. And it, it, it's unhealthy. It's not helpful because it never accomplishes anything. It's unreasonable because it exaggerates our problems, makes them seem bigger than they might actually be. And it's unhealthy. It's just unhealthy because it causes all sorts of physical and emotional stress. In fact, the word worry comes from an old English word. The word is wargon, and it means to choke or to strangle. 
So the picture, the etymology of the word worry is of hands around a person's throat choking the life out of them. War gone. And that's what worry does. It strangles the life out of us. But instead, we want the Lord to be our shepherd. We begin talking with him about absolutely everything. Here's how the Apostle Paul says it in his letter to the Philippians. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. So when we surrender to the Lord, we don't just give up something, we gain something. And what we gain is contentment and peace. So we take the things that we've been worrying about that have been concerning us and we turn those into prayers. We lift them up before God. The Lord's ability is greater than my anxiety. The problem is though, when we read a verse from First Peter like that says, cast all of your anxieties on God because he cares for you. Cast all of your anxieties, all of your worries on him because he cares for you. The problem is most of us do the casting like we do in fishing. We cast our worries out and then we reel them, we reel them back in. We had a friend in Colorado, her name was Mary Jo, and she said, I finally decided with all my worries, I, I finally decided just to throw in the towel, just to give it all up. I just threw in the towel. She said, my problem is I pulled the towel back thread by thread. And that, that can really happen with us. I wanna, I wanna read you a, a, a story that I found in Guidepost magazine. This fellow says, I had been mucking out the stalls for half an hour and I hadn't made a dent because the winter had been colder and snowier than usual. The horses couldn't be let out for long periods and now huge heaps of manure were frozen, frozen solid. Hauling the stuff out of the barn was not easy. The path was blocked by a four foot high snow bank and dragging the bucket full of frozen manure and wet hay was a big pain. Each time I got to the door, I looked for an easy way out, and each time I recalled my mother saying, offer it up. That was her answer to life's hardships, large or small, offer them up to the Lord as a show of humility, service, and love. I stepped outside, pulling the heavy, smelly bucket, and I said, okay, Lord, this is... This, is, this one is in petition for the continued happiness of my family. And I thought of all the families I knew racked by fighting, separation, or divorce. And by the time I got back to the barn, I had tucked in a prayer for those families not as happy as ours, asking God to grant them peace. Good health came to mind with the next load. Here I was, strong of body and mind, able to do what had to be done, if I attacked th this task in manageable loads, I would have the strength to see it through. And again, I thought of others not so fortunate. My aches and complaints were nothing by comparison. And so each time I offered up another load, I came around to realize how blessed I am with a home in the country, a well-paying job, good friends, a wonderful wife, two children. And I finally decided even this chore isn't all that bad. And as the winter sun set red and glorious behind the knoll of ancient apple trees, my wife trudged up the path to do the evening animal chores. But I had beaten her to them, which was a truly unusual event. What a load, she said, staring at the pile the size of a station wagon. Your back must be broken. I said, not really. Instead, a weight that I had been carrying had been completely lifted. My worries were gone, lifted away as lightly as the pale smoke coming from the house's chimney. And each of my cares had been transformed that afternoon into a prayer. It's a pretty good way, pretty good way to, to imagine all of this, to think about it all. 
But there's a, a third thing we need to do in letting the Lord be our shepherd, and that's just center one day at a time. Listen to Matthew chapter 6. Don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of your tomorrow as well. Live one day at a time. That's from the Living Bible, paraphrase of Matthew chapter 6, verse 34. Live a day at a time. Somebody has said you don't, you don't have to open your umbrella until it starts raining. When we worry, we don't do anything about yesterday. We don't control tomorrow. We just simply foul up today. The future can seem overwhelming. So the Lord puts it into 20, 24 hour increments. And Jesus said in that Matthew passage, live a day at a time. He even incorporated it into the prayer that we've already said this morning. We say it every Sunday. Give us this day, our daily bread. Now, the Lord's not saying don't plan for tomorrow. He's not saying don't plan ahead. But he's just simply saying tomorrow is a a new day with the strength of its own. Leslie Weatherhead was a pastor in England during the height of World War II. He lived through the London Blitz and all of the horrible, horrible things that had gone on. And this is one thing that he said. If it's been a good day, thank God. If it's been a bad day, rejoice that it's over and that you're neither in jail nor the hospital. Tomorrow is another day. There's another pastor, Wilbur Chapman. He was asked to go see a fellow in the hospital who was very, very ill. Chapman went into his room and he sat down by the bed and the man told him he was worried about death. He was worried about dying. And Chapman said to him, let me teach you something. Hold up your hand. And so let's do that. Just hold up your hand, palm facing you. Okay, just hold up your hand. Here we go. Chapman said, let me teach you something. Hold up your hand. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And they began to pray that. And so Chapman said to this fellow, every time, every time you begin to get distressed, just pray that the Lord is my, the Lord is my, and when you come to that finger, grab hold of it grab hold of it. The Lord is my shepherd. And they did that. And then he prayed with him through the rest of the psalm. But it wasn't many days later that one of the man's family members came to the hospital room. The fellow had died. And when the family member looked at him, the man was lying there with his hand (laughs) around that finger. Lord is my shepherd. What's got you down or worried or uncertain this morning? Maybe it's finances, maybe it's health, conflict in some relationship, the future, job, or some lack, state of the world. Where are you feeling caught? Listen, Here's what the Lord is saying in all this. I am your shepherd. Your problems are for a while, but my presence is with you always, and my power is forever. So we put him first in our life. We make him Lord, the shepherd of it all. We thank him that we can talk with him about everything. And we thank him that he gives us the strength and the guidance to see it through, to see it through no matter what. We're going to praise him now for that. And one of the ways that we can do it is through this time of communion.
Let us come to this table not because we must, but because we may. Let us confess not that we're righteous, but that we love our Lord Jesus Christ and long to be his true disciples. Let us come not because we're strong, but because we're in need of his love and grace. Let's partake that Jesus may be made known to us in the breaking of the bread. And so may God be with you. We lift up our hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. Isaiah 53, verse 7, gives a prophetic picture of Christ's sacrifice. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In John 10, verse 11, Jesus declares, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So we come to you, O Lord, in this communion. We acknowledge that you are both our good shepherd as well as the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. As our shepherd, you lead us. As the Lamb, you're sacrificed for us. And in grateful thanks, we pray. Amen. And so while they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he said to them, drink of this. Drink of it all of you for this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins and so come now everything is ready Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body.
Jesus said, drink of it, all of you. Let's pray together. Thank you, most holy God, for meeting us here in this meal. May your presence within us ripple beyond us with ever-expanding implications until that day when you gather all your saints from our world to share in your eternal banquet. In all our words and actions, may your name be praised now and forevermore. Amen. We're going to stand and sing together our closing hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. glad that we can lean on you and that you hold us closely. Thank you for your presence here with us now for this time of worship where we're together, but thank you that you go with us into this new week. Help us to realize all over again the joy that's ours because of you, the peace that we can claim because of you, and the hope that we share through you. Go with us, grant us your joy your peace, your hope. We pray it in your name. Amen. Thank mm-hmm. you.